So we are here to uh, motivate the subject a little bit. So why bother about uncertainty quantification? So just uh, as a first uh, example, so we have this case of a photo ad mislabeling two, mislabeling two African-American humans as gorillas. This happened in July 2015. And we have the first driver casualty of self-driving cars in May 2016. Um, so you might imagine these to be kind of the, the failure or the mistake by some random company. But no, in fact, this is Google and Tesla, arguably two of the biggest companies doing what? Doing these tasks that uh, are yeah, driving cars and, and you know, kind of uh, uh, face app stuff. So um, these things do happen and we do need to have a good grasp of the results uh, of our machine learning techniques as well as uncertainties that come with it. And of course, in medical diagnostic results, we want to know how sure we are with our diagnosis. So uh, it's a typical problem where you ask several doctors to make the diagnosis given the same symptoms, and uh, several of them might give you very different um, diagnosis. And you know, there's a big difference when a doctor tells you that you have cancer for sure, and versus you maybe I don't know have cancer maybe, um, then you might want to get a second opinion. Uh, but nevertheless, hopefully this gives you enough reason to care about uncertainty uh, and to take into account whenever you make a calculation, an approximation, how sure are you of your answer and what does it mean to really quantify an uncertainty? Okay, so this is just a very simple example of regression. Uh, here we have a supervised learning task. So uh, you are given the black dots over here and the black dots are partially observed points on this red line, this red curve, this sine wave here is our truth. We call it the ground truth. And given these black dots, we want to reconstruct the ground truth. Um, so clearly, there are not that many black dots. So here, the best I could do in this case, I'm using, I think, a neural network. Um, what I did is I get this regression line. So it's not perfect. You can see it's far from perfect, but it's doing the best it could. And you know, where there are data, it's, it's reasonably close, like this area is pretty close. But you can see that this is all I get, this one line. There's no mention of how uncertainty or certain my, date, my solution is depending on which region uh, at the curve it is. So what I want is something like this. You can see. So here, uh, this is a Bayesian neural network. So today, I don't think we'll be doing that because I want to focus on the MCMC methods themselves. But you can, this is MCMC applied to neural networks. Um, here you can see that where there are no data, there's large swing. And that makes a lot of sense because there's no data. I don't know where it, can, it could come from here. It could come from all the way from the bottom. And where there are data, it's very tight. All right? And where there's less data, you can see it's relatively looser than this region. So this gives us a good idea of the uncertainty of our solution. By looking at this alone, we know that this is quite uncertain and this part is quite certain. Uh, whereas we can't really see that from this, uh, from this left picture right here, which is the standard uh, neural network. Yeah. And of course, there are more um, ways to quantify this, put a number to it uh, so that we can do more analysis with it. Okay, so that is what uncertainty quantification looks like. And that is what we try to do today with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So the way to kind of wrap your head around this uh, is to... So this is a picture from the matrix uh, in this scene, this little ball um, monk, no, Caucasian, Caucasian monk. This Caucasian monk tells the star, uh, the, the, tells Neo, the, the main star of the movie, that uh, do not try to bend a spoon, but realize that there is no spoon. Um, I guess it just kind of reminded me of what it is, what it felt like when I learned this subject, which is to realize that there's no such thing as certainty in real life. Uh, most things, most data have a lot of noise and most data are incomplete. Most models are very complex. So whenever we fit a model, find out a numerical solution, there always comes with, uh, it always comes with the relevant uncertainties. So instead of thinking about point estimates or some answer, we need to start thinking about probability distributions instead. Instead of your variables being something that you want to find out, you are thinking about learning about your random variable, which you know, admits a distribution typically. And okay, I think now's a good time for us to start this. Okay, uh, I am going to share my iPad screen and see how that works out. Okay, let's see if it works. 
All right. Does it work? Hold on. Ah, uh, okay, great. Uh, okay, so for the most part, I'll try to do, uh, let me see if it's better to do horizontal. Uh, maybe a little bit better, vertical. Yeah, okay, let's do horizontal. Okay, so today we will be going through quite a few things. Um, so I'll briefly write a roadmap. And uh, some of these things are kind of the necessary theory for us to start the subject going. Um, and other parts, you will be doing some Im implementations on your own. So we have discussed the problem, which is that uh, we want to be able to learn some uncertainty in our solution. Uh, we'll discuss a bit more about what that means. And this uses probability and uh, Bayes theory. Okay. Um, and then we will also be using ideas from Monte Carlo. Wait, is it not? Oops, is it stuck? Hold on. Yeah, it's stuck. Oh boy, Nani. Ooh, wait, how, how am I suddenly logged out of the meeting? Give me a moment. Uh, well, if I can't do this, uh, well, we could still do it another way. Okay, hold on. Hang in there, people. Did I press something wrong here? Okay. All right. So we'll be talking about Monte Carlo, uh, what, what it kind of is. And we'll be briefly going through about Markov chains. So I won't go, actually, I won't go much into Markov chains as, as much because itself is quite a complicated subject. And as far as the implementation of the algorithm goes, um, it's not actually that crucial to have the theoretical knowledge to use it. And then finally, we are fit to talk about MCMC. We will talk about the first type of MCMC that everyone learns. We'll talk about what it means for it to converge. And we will talk about its hyperparameters. All these kind of uh, fall under the things that you need to care about in order to use the method well. And then we'll go into a bit of uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo theory, which is arguably the most uh, common and popular and relatively advanced variant of MCMC these days. Similarly, we will talk about the relevant hyperparameters. Okay, I hope my writing is not too messy. Oh my god, is it stuck again? Goodness gracious. Uh, so sorry, people. Hold on. Why does it keep dying? Okay. I think you can re exit and put the app. Yeah, that's what I that's yeah, that's what I did. Okay. Oh, this is really bizarre. Okay, well, but if it truly dies again, then we have to figure out some other way to do this. It's going to be a bit tricky. Okay, hopefully it doesn't die again. If it dies, someone please let me know so that, uh, yeah, we can do something about it. And uh, we talk about whether the HMC converge or not. And lastly, we will apply it to uh, a simple, simple data set just to show you how it works, uh, you know, just to give a few of how it works in real life. So all these things are kind of what we'll go through today. It's quite a bit. and. Um, just to give you some idea. So this bit is quite important, the bit about probability and how to set up the problem. Um, obviously knowing the method itself is fairly important uh, for these two parts. And the rest um, are mostly theoretical knowledge that uh, will be very helpful for you to know how to manipulate the method to your own will, um, as well as if you ever feel like going deeper into learning these things, uh, you will have a better idea of what to look out for because these do kind of come from all different directions. <clears throat> okay. No, it died again. Okay, you know what? 
screw it. Let's do it a different way then. Uh, so yeah, I can write on Google Jamboard. Uh, so you're saying it could be the app, huh? Well, maybe. Uh, okay, let's let's try this then. My apologies, people. This has never happened. <laughs> Okay, whiteboard. Let's 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 give this one last shot here. Okay, so just to recap, ever everyone on probability theory. Oh, it's green. Why the hell is it green? Sure, let's use black. Uh, probability. One oh one. Um, maybe just uh in the chat, maybe because if I go faster, if you want. So uh, in the participant the the tab uh, if you're familiar with basic probability up to base theory and familiar with what a Gaussian density is, things like that. Uh, maybe you can put a yes in the chat, uh, in the participant, uh, or no, just put a no, and then I will also just do a quick refresh. Okay, so yes, 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 yes. Oh, okay, so all right, I, I take it that most of you have some background, then I'll just go through really, really fast. Um, so just to be very quick about this, we are working with typically a few forms of probability. So this one is just called the, uh, I guess this one you can just call it probability uh, or marginal probability depending on context. Uh, so Px is just the probability of uh, event x. Okay, and this is some joint probability of uh, x and y, so two variables. And this is the conditional probability, which is a very key uh, concept that will be used uh, repeatedly. So this is the conditional probability of event uh, x given y or condition on y, right, depending on how you call it. So please note that p x given y condition on y is not the same as p y condition of x. All right. So just to give a rough idea, uh, imagine this is you being happy. And this is you uh, scoring exam, getting A plus, right? So if you get exam A plus, you feel happy. That's a pretty high probability. But the other way around, you feeling very happy, therefore getting a high score, uh, I don't think life works in that way. So these two quantities are quite different. Okay. All right. So, okay, in this format right now that I'm doing in this uh, whiteboard style, I can't really save what I wrote, so I can only erase it. Or can I, oh, I can just add, okay, my bad, all right. And just a reminder of what a Gaussian density look like. So a Gaussian density is simply the normal distribution that we are very familiar with. And uh, I'm just gonna write down the form of the density, or you can call it the, the distribution function, probability distribution function, PDF. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is just a bit of recap. Um, so it has this kind of exponential form. Uh, this negative here, this is the standard deviation. This is the standard deviation, and this is the mean. Right. I say, uh, Gaussian and normal is the same, right? Uh, yes, so I, yes. yeah, the question is, is Gaussian and normal the same? Yes, they are the same thing. Um, yeah, I think they are pretty much interchangeable. Uh, yeah, Gaussian and normal, yes. So of course, this is what it looks like, right? So this would be where your mu is. And then typically you have things like, you know, the distance between two uh, sigma might be, uh, might be something like this region, might be something like 95% of all your probability mass or something like that. Yeah. So just to give a reminder. So later you will be using this form to write a bit of code. Um, as you see later. Okay, and just a bit of notation as well. Um, when we say that something is drawn from a probability, we say, so let's say x is drawn from, this is a normal distribution of mean zero and standard deviation one. So this is kind of uh, drawn from or sampled from, and then this would be some type of distribution. And then this would be your random variable. Okay. So this is kind of the first piece of the puzzle. All right, now we are ready to talk about Bayes' theory, just to quickly go through it as well. 
Um, so typically we call D data and theta would be your parameters. So later this will be more concrete, but for now uh, it's just a bit of a precursor. So this is how we write it out. This is just a very standard formulation uh, of Bayes theory that we see quite often. <clears throat> so uh, what we have here is, you can see a bunch of stuff on the right. So let's look at them one by one. This is called, okay, well, so in, in short, the goal is that we want to learn what is on the left, right? This means to say, given some data, D, we want to identify some parameter uh, theta. So the parameter can be uh, a bunch of different things. I'll give some example later. So for example, um, given some temperature of uh, a material, maybe a temperature, maybe you can measure the temperature on this pen coupon, yeah, at different points. Um, you can have some temperature measurements and you want to find out what is the conductivity of the material overall. That's one type of example. Another thing is you can picture some population over time in um, people or some animals, and then you want to infer the birth or death rate um, or some uh, migration rate uh, like that. Or it can be completely a bit more abstract in that the parameter don't have to correspond to some quantity that have very concrete meaning. For example, if you have a neural network and then let's say you are given some data and then you want to infer the weights and biases of your neural network. So that is a perfectly valid question as well. Okay, so here we have the prior. The prior is uh, something that is we choose. So this is chosen by us. Okay. And uh, so this correspond to the knowledge that we have of the parameters uh, prior to the problem. That's why it's called a prior. So for example, if you know by some means, maybe you are an expert in some area and you know that, for example, the, the birth rate cannot be negative, maybe. Oh, well, I don't know if it can be, but assuming that you know for some reason the birth rate is between some region, you can encode that information into this prior by choosing the appropriate prior distribution. Okay. And here we have the likelihood. The likelihood is simply a function that tells you how likely uh, it is to your, for your parameters to be true. In, in essence, you are trying to measure, given some parameter set, uh, the probability of your data happening. Right? So if your parameter is uh, very poorly chosen, then the data might not be, uh, the, the likelihood won't be very high in that your data probably will not be observed. And last but not least, we have this evidence term. This evidence term, you can see that this is uh, independent of theta. Okay, this is independent of theta. And this just serves to make the whole thing uh, a probability distribution so that this is a normalizing constant, right? Normalizing constant. And later we shall see that this is actually a big problem because this particular term is very hard to work with. And so therefore a lot of the times we cannot actually get a full description of our, of our posterior and the left hand side, uh, I should mention at this point that this is called a posterior. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, so um, how the base theory works is quite straightforward. It is that given some prior, Right, and we observe some data, how do we update our belief such that we have uh, a belief that is taking into account the, the value of our data and over time with more data, we get closer and closer and closer and closer to the truth. That's the rough idea. Um, so maybe I can just uh, show a really quick, well, maybe I don't have to do that. So everyone, I'm, so at this point, if you have any problems, you can ask now because later on uh, it would be kind of assuming that you got a kind of comfortable with uh, the base theory. Okay, all right. So now we can talk a little bit about why this normalizing constant is hard to work with. Um, so once again, we have a bit of background in, in base theory. And now just to rewrite the evidence term again, It looks like this, right? And uh, practically speaking, we compute it like this, or rather if we expand it out, this is what it looks like. So this would give us a joint distribution and we marginalize it over some, uh, 
over all possible sets of parameters to get us the probability of the data itself, right? So this is fine, but you realize that sometimes when your theta is high dimension, what you end up with is this, right? And you have this, and you have this, and you have theta one, theta two, da, 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 theta two, theta three, all the way. And this becomes a high dimensional integral that you simply cannot compute. It's too difficult. High dimensional integral. And this is intractable. Okay, intractable, which means that we cannot work with this. It's, it's, it's too bad. It's, it's too hard to compute. So this means that whenever we talk about posterior, a lot of the times we need to talk about it without the evidence term. Now, um, it's still not so bad because the evidence term roughly, uh, well, if you recall, it doesn't depend on your parameter set. So a lot of the times when we talk about posterior, we are talking about just the posterior that is um, unnormalized in the sense that it is proportional simply to our prior times our likelihood. And this is what we are interested in for the most part in, in most applications that you see, right? This is what we're interested in. And later we shall see that MCMC is suited for this application because uh, in MCMC we do not need the normalizing constant and we will see why that is the case in a moment. Okay, so this is the basis of um, the problems that we're trying to solve. So whatever problem that we're trying to solve, we are interested in this quantity right here, this posterior, right? And to get our posterior, we need to combine the prior and the likelihood. So whenever you see a problem, you should think to yourself, what is the prior of what I'm looking for, my parameter of interest, and what is the likelihood? And the likelihood depends on um, the model that we are considering later on. And with that, we can get our posterior. Okay. So that is one part of the puzzle. <clears throat> okay. Oops. Okay. Now we move on to the second part, which is Monte Carlo integration. So Monte Carlo, if, if you guys have heard of Monte Carlo Casino uh, in Monaco, I think. So this was actually uh, developed around the same time as MCMC by this mathematician named uh, Stanley Slaw Ulam. So yeah, Ulam. Um, he was developing this uh, around the same time as the Los Alamos Manhattan Project and he needed a code name for this because he can't talk about this, all uh, top secret. Um, yeah, so the, by the way, if you don't know, the whole um, a nuclear bomb was developed as a secret project. So no one really knew about it. Even when they tested the bomb, no one knew about it. Um, yeah, so he had, to, he had to come up with a code name with his people that he worked with. So he called it Monte Carlo. Uh, and you can see why later on. So the idea <clears throat> is that we want to use random samples to... Um, well, random samples from some distribution to estimate quantities. Uh, now, this sounds kind of vague, but uh, it is because this is a very general approach. In essence, you want to use a bunch of random things to somehow um, have a fairly good estimate of something that is uh, inherently deterministic. And this works, uh, you know, due to law of large number. So if you're not familiar with that, this is what it looks like. So we define, for example, the expectation or the mean, if you will, of some random variable x to be this, right? This is kind of the form. Um, this is how you find a random variable, uh, a continuous random variable. And you can see that when you're doing these uh, expectations and even if you do higher moments, it's still some type of expectations of a higher degree. It is all integration. At the end of the day, it's a lot of integration. And law of large number tells us that if we can have draws of x, samples of x, we can average them and they will approach, as n goes to infinity, they will approach the actual expectation. So in essence, to get the right side, all we need to do is just to find some ways to generate a bunch of these and then we just do an average. Now this is a very powerful idea because it tells us that integration essentially is adding things together and, the, and um, normalizing. Okay, so this is very, very important. Uh, and 
just to be a bit more precise, if we want to find some function of x, not x itself, the mean of some function, uh, what we can do is similarly approximate it with this. Okay? All right. So same thing, uh, our posterior now would be, so, so here would be kind of our theta that we are interested in, right? And we want to maybe estimate the posterior distribution, the mean of the posterior distribution or the variance of the posterior distribution. So here um, at this point, let me just uh, show a really quick piece of code to show how Monte Carlo works. Uh, this one you don't have to write, it's just to show you. Uh, okay, so everyone can see this. So this is a very standard problem um, where the question is, uh, given a protractor, ruler, and pencil, calculate the value of pi. So it sounds like a, one of those very strange things you might find in a puzzle book. Um, but essentially, what we are able to do is to do this. We can draw a circle. We can inscribe a circle, like a quarter circle, inside of a square. And then we just blast a bunch of random points. Right? The, the, it, as long as you do enough of them, we can actually take the ratio of this point, uh, the points that are inside, and then divide it over the average, the total number of points, and then we can have this formula over here such that um, the area of the quarter circle is approximated by the number of points inside and the area of the square is approximated by the number of total points. And then to find out pi, we just make use of the fact that we know that the quarter circle area is uh, pi r squared over four. And then uh, here our square is one, so r is just one. So simply put, our pi approximation is just four times the number of points inside over total number of points, okay? So if I just run this code, so this is, you know, kind of our canvas. And what we do is, uh, so here, okay, here there's too many points. Let me just drop it a little bit. Here, ooh, what happened to this guy? Okay. So here you can see the pi estimate is 3.12, which is, eh, which is all right. But if we increase more points to 1,000, we can see that the pi estimate is 3.17. It's, it's a little, little better, a little closer. Okay, of course, there's still randomness, so you, you kind of get different estimates each time. Um, but you can see that each time you have more and more points that describe whether um, that kind of approximates the area of the circles, which we correlate. So if we do 10,000 points, uh, we can see it's 3.13, which is pretty close to 3.14. And um, here, what we can do, uh, more importantly than to realize that it can do this, is to realize, the, let me comment out this line. Let me comment out this line. So if you want to look at this code, uh, it's in the folder you, if you want to. So here, what I do is, is it gonna run? Okay, cool. So this is me increasing the number of points that I use. So this is uh, from 10 to 1,000. Okay, so this is actually not correct. This is supposed to be multiplied by 10. And you can see the pi estimate, as you add more and more, you can see that the numbers are swinging very far from pi and slowly gets closer, okay? And if we plot the kind of square error, you can see that the error drops uh, as we have more and more Monte Carlo estimates. Okay, so once again, uh, well, okay, so this is, this is what Monte Carlo, uh, the role of Monte Carlo in MCMC, it is essentially the theory that allows us to approximate um, integrals using addition uh, and eventually it's just a normalization. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, cool, all right. I'm moving quite fast, but um, so if you need me to slow down, uh, feel free to do so. All right, let me get back to my whiteboard. Oh, is it still there? Oh no, my stuff is all gone. Okay, whatever, all right. Okay, so quick recap. So now we have the posterior from Bayes' theorem, which is what we want to, which is the probability. Oops, did I share my screen? No. Wait, am I sharing my screen? 
Yeah, okay. So we have the posterior, which comes from the base theory, which is the probability that we are interested to find out about. And the way we find out about this probability is to do approximations by, addition, uh, by doing addition. And this comes from Monte Carlo theory. Right, so this is what Monte Carlo allows us. So now the question becomes quite straightforward, which is that how do we generate these samples? So if we, let's say, have n samples, how do we, how do we get these samples? So you can see just now from that circle example, just with 1,000 points or a few hundred points, we can get a pretty good approximation of pi. Uh, but in real life, it is quite hard to get such good samples. Why? Because um, in real life, a lot of the probability distributions that we work with are very high dimensional. And there's no way, there's, and there's no easy way to sample from them. So to generate this part is kind of the key um, of the MCMC algorithm. It is what it's for. And this is where the Markov chain of Markov chain Monte Carlo comes in. So, uh, okay, so I won't explain exactly what a Markov chain is. I will describe it briefly after we try the first example where we have a kind of a rough idea of how the algorithm works. Um, so for that, for now, we just hold on to that thought um, that the way we generate these things, that, that we generate these samples, oops, is through a Markov chain. So, okay, wait, just a brief uh, a poll. Uh, if you've seen or if you know what a Markov chain is, then say yes in the, in the participant. Um, I don't expect many people to know what it is. Or if no, then say no. Uh, yeah, if it, if it happens to be the case, everyone knows what a Markov chain is, then cool. <laughs> okay, so we have a bit more no than yes. Uh, and that's perfectly expected. That's, that's fine. Um, so it, the, the Markov theory goes pretty, uh, I wouldn't say deep, but it is pretty uh, instructive. There's a lot of definitions involved. Um, then it's really not super helpful in terms of using the algorithm. So for now, I'll just put it on hold and we'll come back to that in a moment, okay? So now we will go on to our first example of the MCMC algorithm. Okay. All right. So I'll draw a picture first to describe what it's supposed to be. So assuming that we are trying to sample from a, uh, this is just a Gaussian, right? So let's say, we start from here. I call it pi one, or when maybe you call it x one, just so because it's on the x axis. So x one. Then from here, I want to generate a next point. So, so to speak, uh, I'm generating my Markov chain. So the way I generate my next point is I have a little distribution, and then I sample from this distribution. Um, so in a moment, this will be more concrete, but for now, it's just a, a intuition. So let's say I, I draw something from here, right? And this is my X, well, maybe not X1. So this is what we call a proposal. So this proposal, I call it X prime. And then what I do is then I take a look at these two points. I can see that this is higher than this, okay? This is higher than this. Therefore, it means that I am at a place of a higher probability, right? That means this X prime gives me higher probability. and I accept this point. When I say accept, it means to say that my new point now moves over. So now I accept it. Now this becomes my x2. Okay. And then now we repeat the process. So let's say we have a little distribution. And let's say I somehow very unlucky or I sample somewhere here. Right. And now we compare these two. And we can see that my new point, my x prime, is now much lower than my x2. Um, and in this case, I accept it with some probability, with some low probability, okay? That means to say that for the most part, I'm probably going to reject it um, if it's very low, but there's still a chance that I accept it, okay? And then, so if I reject it, that means I don't go over, meaning, meaning to say that I kind of just ignore this part and I start over. I sample again something else from this little distribution over here. And I keep on repeating this process. So overall, the picture that you should see is kind of like this, kind of having this point, jump to here, jump to here, jump to here, jump to here, jump, 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 jump. And all these samples are gonna get collected, right? They're gonna get collected. And you know, you can you know, maybe plot a histogram. And over time, the idea is that the histogram 
it's going to look like your, um, your, the distribution that you're interested in. So um, to relate this back to Markov chains, essentially what you are doing is that you are generating a Markov chain that is able to traverse the parameter space in a way such that higher probability according to the density, according to this target density that we're interested in, correspond to a more frequent occurrence of the, of the parameter itself, right? So, okay, so I say that again. Essentially, you're generating a Markov chain that is able to go anywhere, right? But it will go to places with higher probability, higher proportion of the time. That's the idea, right? So in, in technical terms, the Markov chains are called um, ergodic, and it suffices detailed balance. Now I'm just saying these words, um, I'm not gonna explain what they are because it's a bit in, involved, um, but I'm saying these so that if you want to find out, you can Google those things and see for yourself uh, a bit more detail what they mean. So again, uh, so that's the, that's the idea is that we are generating a Markov chains with these, with these characters. And if they have these characters, these mathematical characteristics, then we can say for sure that the, jet, the, the samples that we generate will eventually look like our um, Gaussian distribution over here or whatever distribution that we tell it to sample from. Okay, wait, I see a, a few questions. Supervised right, has to be validated with a label. Um, so Changxuan, no, this is nothing to do with that. There's no label of any sort. Um, maybe later it will be a bit more apparent what we are trying to do, but this is not at all supervised learning, uh, or, or at least it's, yeah, it's, it's not what you're considering. You need to know the X to validate. How does the Markov chain work for higher dimensional parameter? Oh, okay, so let me try to answer a few questions first from the chat. Um, so for Changshun, I'm not exactly sure what you mean to validate. So maybe you can explain more uh, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, like what I'm saying is that Let's say for just now the example that you gave, yep. you, you managed to like put as pi as 3.13 or something, but you still need to validate, uh, like you know that there's a, you know the ground truth is 3.142, so you, you still have to validate that to kind of like get a probability, how close it is compared. Uh, yes, okay, yeah. So um, you, you're right. So the, the example that I showed, I know the ground truth and I can show that, oh, look, I'm getting closer to the ground truth, right? Um, that's absolutely true. And in the moment, we'll play some toy examples where we know the ground truth. But in real problems, you don't know the ground truth. So in real problems, this whole, um, for example, right now, let's say you are looking at the, um, you are looking at this uh, distribution that is uh, the red color. In real life, you don't know what this is. So you can only infer what it is from your samples. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we, maybe we implement it first and you can continue this question uh, if it's still the same question or if it maybe yeah, takes a different form. How does Markov chain work for high dimensional parameters? Uh, so this is where it gets a little more technical. So um, Markov chain, if you have learned it a little bit, mostly most of the time you start with a discrete Markov chain. Uh, in that you have countable states, but here you are doing the Markov chain on probability distributions. So um, the, the, the intuition are the same in that you are trying to move from one state to another and you have some distribution that you're following. Uh, you have some transitions and you have a stationary distribution and all that. Um, but in short, it works the same. Yeah, it works the same. Things becomes much more slower in high dimension, much more inefficient, but it works the same. How do we choose the little probability distribution? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So this little probability distribution is called the proposal distribution. So here, um, you can see in this toy example, please remember that this is only a toy example. Um, and this toy example is indeed a bit contrived because we here itself is a Gaussian, right? And of course, if we can sample from a Gaussian easily, we would not need to do MCMC on a Gaussian, right? But this is just for the sake of practice. Um, and Weipin correctly pointed out that uh, well, Gaussian is the most appropriate for the little distribution. So the Gaussian is, I would say, is the easiest. It's the most amenable to analysis, meaning to say when you write things down, it is the most easy to write down. You can take differentiation, you can do a bunch of stuff, and when you do um, some analysis to, 
to do some math, to do some limits, um, the numbers work out very nicely using Gaussian. Um, so a lot of time that's what we use, but in fact, there is no need to use the Gaussian. You can use almost anything you want really. Um, and we will try that later. Okay, so that is just a pictorial explanation of what the algorithm is. So now I'll give kind of the formal statement. Okay, so, so to start MCMC, Uh, okay, I need a few things to start. To start, I need my starting point. I need a uh, proposal distribution. And I need my target. So this is my proposal. So the proposal distribution must be something that you can easily sample from. So like a Gaussian or like a uniform, something like that. Most of the times we'll be using Gaussian. Um, and for many reasons, uh, like I said, it's the most easiest to use, um, but a lot of times it works fairly well as well. Uh, and then this is our target density. Target density. In this case, it will be our posterior. And then we need to have this little hyperparameter called the step size. And in a moment, you will see the step size is incredibly important. Okay, so we need one, two, three, four things, right? Four things. So the algorithm goes as such. Uh, don't worry, later when you try this out in the notebook, I think I've written a copy of this instruction in there as well. So first we generate a sample uh, from the from the from the proposal distribution. So here if we use a normal, that means we are just sampling from a normal distribution and your standard numpy, scipy, whatever pi library, you can just do that off the bat. And this one, in this case, it will be a normal uh, centered at mu equals to your previous point, uh, and then your sigma equals to your step size. So this is a 1D example, okay? So you generate your proposal. And next, you compute this thing called the um, acceptance probability, which is computed as such. So this is a ratio like this. So this is your proposal and you compute this ratio here. So you don't need to write any of this down, of course. Um, I, I have provided it in the notebook. Um, okay, so let's look a little bit about what this means, right? So this part here corresponds to the ratio of the two posterior distribution um, probability level. So for example, like these two points, right? So obviously if my proposal point is higher than my previous point, uh, then this ratio will be greater than one, okay? And this ratio, if you notice, in our standard Gaussian example, so if you recall the Gaussian distribution form, uh, you will notice that you can swap the X and the U, they are uh, symmetric. So these two terms will cancel out because they are symmetric. So you can swap them around and they are the same. So this will go to one. So in our most basic example, there's only one term here, right? This means to say that, and we only take the minimum of the two, right? Later we'll see why. So minimum of the two. So meaning to say if my pi theta prime is higher than my pi theta t, um, I, then alpha is just equals to one because if this is higher than one, and then we pick minimum between one and that. So that means it can go as high as one only. Okay, all right. And then last part is we pick a uniform distribute, uniformly distributed random variable here between zero and one. And then we do the following uh, decision, right? Except else, uh, Reject. So if my u is smaller than alpha, then I will accept my point. This means to say that my, my t plus one uh, is assigned to be my proposal, meaning I accept the proposal. Or my proposal is my new point. If I reject it, my new point is simply my previous point. Okay, so I reject the proposal. So notice that u, right, u, is only between zero and one. So if alpha is one, it is a guaranteed acceptance, right? So this means again, if 
this means to say, once again, let's say you are from, from here. If you move to here, then you go up in probability, then the ratio will be higher than one. This means to say your alpha is one, and this means to say that you accept. So essentially, if you move to a region of higher probability, you accept, right? And if you move to a region of low probability, you accept it with this probability, with alpha. Okay, so meaning to say if it's fairly close, but less maybe 80% of the previous probability, then you accept it with 80%, right? So overall, this gives the phenomena that you only accept weekly uh, low probability points very few of the times, but you still do accept them sometimes so that overall you can get the pattern overall as a histogram. Okay, any questions? So at this point, uh, you'll be trying out for your first, uh, first practical, if you will. So if you have questions, uh, now would be a good time. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Uh, yep. Is it I for the two-dimensional case? Do you uh change two parameters at the same time or keep one uh parameter constant and then you sample from the Kupolo distribution for the other one? Oh. Um. Or so do you sample like two. You sample twice and then compute the ratio. Okay, that's actually a very, very interesting question. So uh, the question is, what do you do when you have a 2D example right? or whatever, however how many, many dimensions? So in this implementation, this is called the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, by the way. And if you pick your proposal distribution to be, uh, to be a Gaussian, then it's called a random walk, right? So in random walk, you can pick your Gaussian and as many dimensions as you want. So you do sample a proposal to a complete new point in all directions, all the dimensions, okay? Okay, uh, sorry, can you, can you repeat that again? Ah, yes, so you see, um, so in 1D, in 1D, right, you send your, if you start from here, your proposal can only go left and right, right? Yeah. So in 2D, if you have, later you also try a 2D example, you know, if this is a contour plot and you start from here, then yeah, your, your Gaussian will be kind of a, like a circle, and then you can go you know, somewhere around here. So you do oh, pick okay. two directions, yeah. Um, but interestingly, if you pick, if you keep one and pick only one direction, meaning to say you move like this, right? You know, yeah. you keep one and move only one, this is called Gibbs sampling. It is another type of, it's a, it's a special case of MCMC. Um, but to do Gibbs sampling, it's a little bit different because you would need to be able to sample from the conditionals because you're keeping one still and moving the other. Uh, we will not be covering that today. Um, but if you are interested, Gibbs sampling is also one of the basic forms of sampling that is very interesting and um, yeah, offers a lot uh, about the subject. Okay, so I hope All that right, answered your you. question. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what if, what if uh, let's say, your system has, uh, let's say, let's say for this, your system has more than one local, uh, more than one local maxima. Oh, wow. Okay. The, the, all your questions are very, very good. And they are difficult questions in terms of how to deal with them using algorithm. So, so if you have two local maxima, right? By my picture just now, it means to say that if there's a good chance that I might stay around here, right? My samples might stay around here. And so once in a while, you go to a low region and very, very rarely it will get to jump over, correct? Because it's such a low, low probability region here, right? So in, yeah. this, in this situation, you are indeed right that it is very hard. So a standard random walk would not do well at all. In fact, standard MCMCs would not do well at multimodal situations at all. Um, there, are, uh, there are methods called simulated annealing where they... So how it basically works is that you let it move around for a while and once in a while, it will just start a jump and you just jump somewhere and then it will do a mixing again. So if it's closer to this mode, then it will end up in this mode and it will jump, it will jump. So it allows for random big jumps so that you can jump between modes if there are multiple modes. Um, again, I will not be covering that today, but that is also a, a class of MCMC algorithm. Uh, then, you can, yeah. Then, okay, I understand that. So. Uh, the, the other question would be that uh, all these works if you have a lot of observations, right? What if your system is underdetermined? Oh, um, so when you say system, do you mean the data points, the part? When you have yeah, yeah, the, num the number of observations is low. Um, actually, uh, that's a very good question. So 
in fact, how the typical kind of flow would be, you have some data, then you build your posterior, right? Then you do your sampling like this. So in fact, when data is very low, what this means is to say that your posterior is typically very, um, very dispersed in the sense that you don't have a very certain answer, correct? So instead, yeah, so for correct. example, if you have, you have a lot of answers, if you have a lot of, oh, sorry, if you have a lot of data, then your posterior might be super sharp because this, this represents certainty, right? This means that I am very sure this is the answer. The answer is 2.5, that's it. And you know, with minimal, um, minimal variance. So when your data is low, it gives you something like this maybe, okay? And in fact, it is when data is low that we need to use MCMC and, and you know, relevant methods for uncertainty quantification. Why? Because when data is low, if you still do like a MLE, like a maximum likelihood, you will still get the same answer, but you will have no sense of how wide this part is, right? So to answer your question, when data is very low and your system is underdetermined, naturally you will have a lot of uncertainty in your system. Uh, there's nothing you can do about that in terms of changing that situation. But within those situations, uncertainty, quantification, and MCMC and things of that nature would be very, very important to help you learn about your posterior in a more uh, meaningful way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you. You're right. Okay. Um, okay, so we will start the first. Uh, so the link, uh, I, I believe I've screened it at the start, but I can always put it up again. Uh, so but this is the. Oh, hold on. Uh, okay, so this is what we want to work on. So maybe I can print out. Where is my... Okay, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Ah, okay, I think someone did already. Owen, thank you. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, I have been moving rather quickly. So, ooh, what is this? So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. And this is the first example that you'll be working with, which is to code up your own random walk metropolis. Okay, let's see if it runs. So I think everyone can see right on my screen. Yep. So the parts where there are blanks is parts where you want to fill them in. Um, yeah, it is on the collab. And I think you might want to download it onto your own station so that you can edit it. Uh, yes, so at this point, I think I will leave you guys to work on this for, uh, how long do you need? 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and I'll be here obviously just uh, answering your questions. So here you can see that I've given you the instructions that's necessary and you will need to implement the algorithm. And later I'll go through briefly the standard implementation that I have. Okay, and the uh, histogram. Oh, okay, in this case, I'm also doing the 2D Gaussian. So I'm doing 1D and 2D um, just for a bit of variety. And 2D allows you to see a bit more interesting visualizations as well. Uh, okay, so if you have any questions, let me know, or you can't access the file. But other than that, um, I'll leave you guys and now let's let's meet back at say two fifteen. If it's too short, uh, I can give you more time. But two fifteen, we'll check in again. Okay, thank you, everyone.
Okay, there are questions. Uh, we send privately. Let me answer those. Oh yes! Wow, An another great question. So the question says that um, so if you um, so the question says that if you are sampling each of your proposal from this small proposal distribution, each state is actually connected to the other states, right? That's absolutely true. Um, if we recall back to the Monte Carlo experiment, uh, the circle experiment where each points are drawn independently, right? Independently. So they, they do not correlate. Um, but in this case, in Markov chain Monte Carlo, it is not the case. Each points are correlated because again, if you are in one location, the next point is it highly depends on your current location. You can only swing around some region, right? Um, that is true. And so that might make you think that, oh, then how does your law of large number works because you require IID, right? Um, but the cool part is that if you construct your Markov chain correctly, which are according to these rules, which is that you make a proposal and then accept or reject with some probability, you are indeed still able to use those samples to fit your Monte Carlo uh, estimate. Yeah. So in, in short, yes, all the states are correlated. And that is something that we'll deal with later to think about how to make, how to improve that situation. But uh, them being correlated doesn't spoil the method. Good question. Yeah, yeah keep up uh, with all the good questions coming up. There's a lot of very high quality questions. That's good.
Oh, in the meantime, here's a dog. So, the board. So I have a question. Um, what is a library RVIS? Uh, okay, I think in this particular example, we are not using RVIS, um, but RVIS is a library that will help us analyze our Markov, our Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo samples. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more of what it does and we'll use it in the next notebook. Yeah, but for this one, you actually don't need it. All right, uh, maybe give you guys another minute and we'll come back to it. Uh, do you guys need more time? If you need more time or, or if you're done, you can just put it in the chat, say done or need a few more minutes or impossible to do, don't understand. Yeah. That's it. Done. All right. No, um, okay, so Changxun, just to just to poll a bit. So have you heard of these things before? Markov chain or like uh MCMC? Or is this your first time doing it? I just want to get a gauge of okay, a bit so you don't have a, a bit of background. Okay. Yeah, I just want to see if this pace or this coverage of content is it appropriate because i didn't cover uh, uh, quite some things but i feel like if i talk too much of theories it's no point okay so it is 2 15. uh so can i roughly get uh for everyone as well to just use the participant tab and if you manage to do the exercise, just put a yes or no, just put a no, just to get a sense of uh, how everyone's doing so far. Yeah, it's okay. I'll go through the answers anyway. So it, you know, it's fine. We have a bit of no, no. Okay, this is perfectly fine. So uh, let me explain briefly what the, 
what it's supposed to look like. Okay, so all right, is everyone back? Okay, so here, just to reiterate again, because I understand so far, if this is all new to you, there's a lot of moving pieces, right? You have the something base theory, and then you have Monte Carlo, then something about Markov chain, and then rejection, and then a bunch of weird things going on. Um, oh, what's this? Okay, I don't need all this. Um, so just to reiterate, and uh, of course, I assume that everyone has a bit of Python background. So uh, some of these things are kind of standard practice stuff that I didn't explain. So if you don't understand, for example, this C, this RNG, um, you can ignore it and you can do whatever that makes sense to you. But this just helps you generate random numbers uh, with, a, with a C. Okay, done. Uh, okay, so this is the distribution that we, are want, to, that we want to sample from. So of course, if you notice, this is a very, very simple function. So indeed, we can just plot the entire function and be done with it. Um, but this is just a practice. So we are not too concerned about how trivial this problem is. So first things first, we need to be able to, to define this density. So here, uh, I would just write down literally the math of it. Uh, I can do one over, I should have a nice one prepared. Oh, well. Sigma or STD 1D, wait. Or in this case, I call it STD uh, sigma squared. And as you can see, I'm, you know, I, I don't necessarily code very fast or whatever. Doesn't really matter. Uh, square divided by divided by two divided by std square what do i keep and x minus mean okay so this is my density all right uh and one thing to notice is that i actually forgot to mention this but okay i'll, I'll mention it later so i can run this and now i need to write my metropolis hastings algorithm so again, first step is to define my current position as, as, as initial point. So this is done for me. So current, I just use the name cur as current. You can use something else if you want to. And then um, I generate a proposal by sampling from a normal distribution. So just for everyone to see, you can sample from a normal distribution using RNG dot standard uh, normal. So this is standard normal. It's just sampling uh, uh, a normal a number from a Gaussian, a standard Gaussian. Standard meaning mean zero, uh, mean zero, and standard deviation of one. Okay. Okay. So each time you sample is something different, and this is what you want to use to generate your, uh, your proposals. Okay. And of course, if you want to have a different mean, you put let's say two, and then if your standard deviation is three, then it's three. Then you get something different. Wait, what's this? Oh, because okay, standard normal shouldn't take in anything because it's standard. So this should be just normal, I think. Yeah, so you get something like this. Um, just a little trick here. Let me, I can write it down for everyone to see. Um, if you sample x from mu sigma square, right? This is the same as sampling x from mu equals one. And then, oh, maybe not like, maybe not like this. Like this, maybe sample a psi from zero one, and then x equals mu plus sigma psi. These are the same thing. So instead of sampling from a normal Gaussian, uh, it's not normal. Sorry, a uh, sample from a Gaussian with mean mu and sigma square as your variance, you can instead just sample from a standard Gaussian and then add a mu and then multiply by sigma externally. It's the, it's the same thing. Okay, so here we want to choose our step size as defined as our standard deviation. So I usually prefer to do this method um, because it looks a little, uh, well, there are some reasons, but uh, yeah, maybe later it'll be a bit more apparent. Okay, so what I want to do here is simply just to have, let's say a proposal that I call prop and then I have it as uh, my current, which is my mean, plus my RNG dot standard normal. 
uh, multiplied by my step size. Okay, so just to say this is the same as sampling from n uh, curve step size squared. Okay, so this gives me my proposal. And then next thing I want to compute this alpha. So I compute my alpha, I take min uh, one comma, uh, once again, you realize that, once again, I said that um, these two cancel out. So in fact, I don't need to type those. And my pi is my density that I want. So I have my density here that I pass in. Uh, density prop, prop divided by density curve. Okay, so this gives me my acceptance probability. And then lastly, I have my mu equals to rng dot uniform uh, zero one. This is the to pick this u sample from zero one, All right? You can use any library you want. Uh, and last but not least, if u less than alpha, I accept. Accept meaning to say, um, I accept my proposal. So my current point now becomes my proposal. And if not my if not, then nothing happens because my current point then is then my current point. So I don't need to write anything. And lastly, just to keep everything in check, I will have my samples dot append. I will just keep check of my samples, uh, curve, which is my current sample. And here I will also do a little um, tally of adding my accept just to count how many times I accept it. And I want to return. So for example, I want to return uh, the number of acceptance uh, or the acceptance ratio and the number of and the samples. So I would turn them into an array. You can, yeah, uh, you don't have to turn them into an array, but I think later you plot it might be a bit tricky. So, well, maybe in retrospect, all these formatting things I should be good. Uh, and my acceptance would be accept divided by total number of iterations. Uh, iterations which is given to you, yeah. So if I accept total, this gives me my acceptance ratio, which means how many times I accept. Let's see if this runs. Let's give me an error. Does it run? Okay, great. It runs. So now that it runs, let's check the. So what this does is just a plot. Oh, what's going on? Um, MCMC sample analytic Gaussian. Oh, what's what's this? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Zero two. Okay. Uh, samples dot pen. Curve prop. Hmm. Why am I not getting any acceptances? Hold on. I think there's some issues here. Oh, hold up, what is going on? Wait, is my, <laughs> is my method wrong? Hold up. Okay, let me quickly, quickly debug it to see if I'm doing things right. Uh, Okay. Uh, posterior. Try, oh, my bad. Uh, da, 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 da. And the normal. Yeah, it should work. Hmm. Wait, something's wrong. Oh, maybe my posterior is all screwed up. Uh, x minus mean square divided by two. Uh, uh, actually, I don't need this part because uh, well, it's it's all it's all. Well, it shouldn't matter because it's all the same because it is just a standard. It's just a constant. Hmm. Wait the heck. Did I do something wrong? Did anyone get something right? Because wait, hold up. This is looking very strange to me. 50. Oh. 
Well, it just doesn't have any in my other notebook there. Oh, could it be because of? Oh my God. Oh, I'm an idiot. Yes, someone corrected. <laughs> There's no loop. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to put a loop. God damn. Okay, yeah, you're right. My bad. Ah, uh, boy. That's what a lame I can do to you, I suppose. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Int object is not interpol. Wow, man. What is happening, guys? Ah, okay. Hopefully this works now. Um, let's see. Thousand samples. Oh, why is it taking so long? It's supposed to be. Oh, it's taking a while. Wait. Okay. I think it's because I some formatting stuff. All right, let's see if this one runs now. Sorry everyone for the delay. Oh boy, this be taking a while. Okay. What? Oh my God. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I don't know what's happening exactly. It's taking so slow. Hmm. I think something like that. Okay, okay, okay. Mm, looks good. What? Okay, hold up. Maybe let me just restart this. Uh, how do I turn off the? Uh, does the same command work on notebook? Oh wait, yeah. Sorry, I don't know what's going on, but let me rerun stuff again. I don't know what is up. Yeah, I ran it before. It's quite fast, but I don't know why it doesn't suddenly. Pick up. Can't see one D. Yes, this one is by Nani. Wait, why is it not history? So sorry, guys. Huh? So it's dying. Okay. Yes. Did you put in the MP dot array? I think the MP dot array really speeds things up. Okay, you did. I did, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. So there we go. Um, okay, so you can see this one doesn't look exactly very much like... Um, so sorry for the delay, by the way. Um, so this, you can see the orange curve uh, is supposed to be what the whole histogram should look like. And you can see here, you know, it's not very well represented, right? So this now comes the real challenge of using MCMC, which is the how do we know our results are good or not? So first things is that we can print, by the way, uh, we can print, well, we can show our acceptance rate. So 98%, okay. So just to give a quick intuition here. So once again, if you start from here, the step size tells you how big a step you take, right? So similarly, it tells you how big the proposal distribution is, tells you how big a step to take. So naturally, if the step is bigger, you stand to gain more in the sense that you get to travel to somewhere further, you get to explore more of the region, but you also stand to lose more in that you also, there's a higher chance for you to go to regions with very low probability in which you often face rejection, right? And if it's a very small step, if it's a very small step, then, you know, you are nearby. So 
your so your acceptance ratios are going to be pretty high, right? It's always going to be pretty much close to one. And that means you will be a lot of accepting. You have a lot of acceptance in your samples. But is that necessarily a good thing? No, because when you have a small step size, you explore the regions very slowly. You explore the regions very, very, very slowly, which is what's happening now. You can see when I see my Gaussian acceptance to be close to one, it means to say that I'm always accepting. That's a good indication that my step size is too small. Right? So let's make it a little bigger, uh, 0.5 maybe. And you can see 0.91, okay, it's a little better. So now it is rejecting 10% of the time. And you can see the results are much better already. Right? So let's try to make it a little bigger. So there's a bit of tuning here to be done. Uh, there are some methods where you don't have to tune, but we can, yeah, we can explore those later. So let's try to get it down to... So um, I think the theoretical optimal... So, so again, this is a question of um, exploration versus exploitation. Right? If you have a big step size, you explore, but you might lose more. If you have a small step size, you always accept you exploit, but then you, you gain very little each time. Um, so the, the acceptance ratio alone, high or low, doesn't tell you how well or how good the step size choice is, right? Because you want to strike a balance between the two. So I think the theoretical optimum is actually very low. It's something like, I think, 24%. Yeah, so if you can hit 24, it typically means to say that you have a good, uh, it is a reasonable step size. But uh, in, for practice purposes, as long as it's not too low or too high, somewhere in the middle, like 82%, that's okay. That's okay. So you can see this is quite a nice representative of the Gaussian density here. All right? And of course, if you increase more points, let's say 5,000, um, then you have even a, 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 more, a better representation yet. Okay? So in the situation, remember, when you are solving the real-life problem, you do not have this orange curve. All you have are your samples. So in those cases, this is, would be a, quite a good approximation, I would say, to the actual solution. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, and all right, I will move on to the second example, which is Gaussian. I took a bit of time just now, so I'm gonna move a little faster. So the 2D Gaussian is same as the 1D case um, in principle, just that now you have two dimensions, and when you have two dimensions, your standard deviation is obviously no longer a number. It is now a matrix called the covariance matrix. And when you divide, previously you can see you are dividing by, uh, you are dividing by standard deviation squared, uh, variance squared. So you can't really divide a matrix per se. Um, so you are doing an inverse, okay? So here I am providing you with the inverse, right? Using the linear algebra library, you can compute the inverse. And so here would simply be a np.exp. Um, well, I'm just going to do it the kind of straightforward way. Multiply by uh, x, x minus mean uh, dot t at co in at, at means multiplication for matrices. And I think that's enough brackets. Enough. Okay, and this should give us uh, simply, and you can see the M, the MH sampler, the algorithm is the same, right? So I don't need to touch anything, right? So that's why uh, all I do now is I, oops, sorry, all I do now is I pass in the Gaussian density in 2D, right? And my starting distribution, uh, starting position is now 2D instead of one number, right? So now there's two numbers here. And naturally, like just one of, uh, one of someone asked, uh, do you propose a move in 2D? That's correct. Because if you notice the way I, oh, sorry, my bad, I didn't do this part. Uh, I should do dim. Yes, so this takes into account the dimensions of my proposal. So now I'm, uh, and now I am proposing a standard normal draw of two dimensions, right, two numbers. Okay, so now this is correct. So for the 1D case, it didn't matter because it's 1D anyway. But here, uh, you should see a bit of a, uh, difference. So now here we have a bit of plotting code, don't really have to read those, but here you can see the contour plots of what the actual solution is and this is where you start all the way from the right here and you can see da, 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 it moves and it starts to explore. Right? And once you explore you can see that in the middle is a denser region, you can see the, the lines are a little denser here and on the outskirts it's a bit of a thinner region, but nevertheless you still uh, explore the general region. So this image is very, very important because um, if we, let's say, uh, if we plot something like this, 
uh, if we can plot this, um, you can see this is one of just one of the dimensions, and then you know, naturally you can plot the other one if you like. So remember, once again, we are talking about making approximations, right? So all these Markov chain Monte Carlo samples at the end should go into one of these, um, you know, approximations. So in this case, this will approximate our mean, right? The mean of our, um, the mean of our parameter. So I can just average them, right? But clearly, you can see that there's a there's a region where it comes down, and then it kind of then starts squiggling around, right? So this is very important because when we take our um, our estimations, we do not want to take into account this point, right? You can see that this corresponds to this region in the plot where we have this kind of, this phase, that this phase where it approaches over, right? In this case, we say that the Markov chain has not converged, right? And then when the Markov chain reached here, then we can say it converged, right? So in this phase, we call this part, we call it the warm up, uh, or uh, I guess people also call it the burn in, right? So these are the burn in samples, and then we have our actual samples that we want to use. So when you diagnose your result, when you look at your plots, you want to exclude these results because these results um, are not representative of your actual solution. Right, and you can in this in, again in this a low dimensional two D case you can clearly see that it approaches your distribution, right? But in high dimension, sometimes it's not super easy to see these things. So to be safe, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people prefer to just get rid of the first few parts of your chain anyway, just to be sure, right? Um, okay, so this is the two D Gaussian. So if you manage to follow that then congratulations, you have coded your first Monte Carlo Markov chain, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method, your um, random walk metropolis. Uh, and what else is there? Uh, let me see in my notes. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So once again, just to remind you, Look at this uh, function and notice that you need to choose the step size. So the step size is arguably the most important parameter, a uh, hyperparameter of the algorithm that you want to think about. Too high a step size, too much rejection. Too low a step size, slow exploration. Okay, and then having to balance these two uh, is, is incredibly important because once again, at the end of the day, you only have your output, you only have your uh, samples to work with. So if you have bad samples, you need to be able to have ways to identify that. Okay, so one way that we saw just now was through the plot. So this is what we call a trace plot. By we, we literally plot out the, the actual locations of each of the dimensions of the sample positions. Um, again, in high dimensions, these things are much harder. So we have to resort to other ways to do it, which we'll see later. Okay, so this concludes the kind of the first um, implementation for MCMC, any questions? Okay. So here- uh, the, inverse, the inverse of the matrix, right? Uh, yep. That is the only inverse that we can use or can we try explore other kinds of inverse? Oh, of course. So, so this is just um, a toy kind of setting for our problem, right? Uh, you can change this in a co covariance matrix to get a different shape of, you know, if you, you can change it to get something like this. Oops, sorry. You can change it to get something like this. And you can change it to get something like this. You know, you uh, can change it. Uh, sorry, what I mean was that, uh, what if I use like a pseudo inverse? Oh, pseudo inverse. Um, yeah, you could do that. So uh, I guess what uh, this gentleman is asking is that sometimes computing the inverse is expensive. Is that why you're getting it? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so for those who are not familiar with uh, matrix computations, computing the inverse is typically something that you don't want to do. And um, a lot of the times in algorithms, you actually do not have to do it because sometimes your uh, matrix has some structure. Uh, they are constructed in some ways that there are some shortcuts to compute it. And there are times where you can also, um, your, where sometimes your matrix are, is not invertible even. So you might not have an inverse. 
in those cases, if you really want an inverse for whatever reason, you could uh, subject it to technical constraints, use a pseudo inverse. Uh, in this case, this particular example, the inverse is just part of the definition of the target density. So um, you could use it if you want. When the pseudo, when the inverse exists, the pseudo inverse is the inverse, right? So let's just get that clear first. That's a technical detail there. So you can use the pseudo inverse if you want, but in this case, it's a very small matrix. Um, uh, anything smaller okay, than that, okay. yeah, there's no real difference in computational time anyway. <clears throat> yeah. And Python is quite optimized to do very, very small numbers anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, all right. So any more questions about this segment? So the next segment would be to really um, <clears throat> take this as a starting point and then explore Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is arguably the more advanced version of uh, MCMC variants. So anything if you're not sure and not comfortable with, you might want to ask now and get a refresher maybe. Okay, um, I have a question in the chat. Very similar to GRE results. If you don't have analytic distribution, how do you know whether MCMC implementation is correct? Again, a uh, very good question. So in real, so right now I have a very nice analytic form, super clean, right, one line. And obviously this is just an example. In real life, you don't even have a nice form like that typically. You have some prior that you can multiply with some likelihood and you get some very messy form. Uh, if everything is picked in a nice way, you can get what we call a conjugate prior and then you can get a nice form for your posterior. Um, if you know what that is, then you know, is there something you can do? If you don't know what that is, you don't have to, you don't have to stress about that. Um, but when you don't have your analytic distribution, so here, here's a few ways you can do things. Um, first, to check, your implement, uh, to check your MCMC implementation is correct, the simplest way is to test it against a toy problem, which is like a unit test, if you will, I guess. So you test it against something where you know the ground truth or the answer is, and then you take that as uh, empirical evidence that it works, uh, it is a correct method. Generally, that's the main idea to check for MCMC implementation correctness because you don't have an answer in your real life problems. Yeah. Um, there are other ways to check whether your chain has converged or not, but that's kind of a slightly separate question. Yeah. Because even if your chain has converged, it doesn't necessarily mean you are doing things correctly. You could converge to the wrong thing, for example. Yeah. So for uh, example- Sorry, when, when you say converge, you mean that the chain moves to the, the probability density, is it? Yes, yes, that's what I mean, yeah. So um, the, again, how, one question is, how do you pick your initial point, right? It's not straightforward, right? A lot of times you don't know, so you just randomly pick. Um, in, so if you pick somewhere super far like this, then you best be ready to wait before it can get to somewhere here, right? There you can see. And you can, without this plot, you can still roughly see if you have a trace plot, you can see something like this. There you know that, oh, okay, this, this guy is just kind of waiting to converge. So when we see this, we call this convergence, right? So um, naturally, if you're familiar with high dimensional stuff, uh, curse of dimensionality and all that stuff, in real life, if you pick a random point, it might take forever to even get somewhere near, right? Because it's so low probability that it just, it just takes uh, forever and it's not a good idea. So typically what people do is <clears throat> they start from some estimate. So maybe they do MLE, MAP, whatever, op some optimization, then they might get somewhere near or maybe some local minima or maxima even, um, and then they start exploring from that estimate. Yeah. So typically in real problems, there's a optimization phase before that, or some type of some type of optimization that gets you to a good starting point. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Also, right. when you extrapolate this, it becomes a Levy distribution, right? <coughs> or something. I think so. Mm, extrapolate what this? I mean, like if you if your constraints are your constraints are kind of like uh, fixed, then your, and you disregard the warm up, then it looks like it becomes a Levy distribution. Is, is that right? Uh, okay, wait, let me, I'm not super, I don't recall really familiar with Levy distributions. Let me see. Um, so are you saying the distribution of the point? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, um, I don't think it has anything to do with Levy distributions. I think this is purely 
just a, a trajectory. So what you're, what I'm seeing here, uh, what I'm seeing here, if uh, here, this is just a trajectory of the sampler moving in some direction. So this, oh, okay, yeah, okay. Th this is not some type of distribution plot. Yeah, this is just a, a trace of the trajectory of the sampler. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. All right, okay, so take a deep breath because things are get, about to get a bit more heavy. And um, I contemplated quite a bit whether to have a f whether to have you guys code the subsequent parts from scratch, but I don't think it's necessarily the best idea because the implementation itself you know has a lot of has a lot of moving parts and it bit, might be a bit tricky and at the end of the day um, I don't think many people code this themselves you probably use some library to do it so more importantly is to understand what those things are so that is what we're going to get into next so okay Okay, so the next part that we're going to get into is called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So for those who have, oh, for those who have heard of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or Hamiltonian, you might have heard of it from a physics sense. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, let me charge my stuff. Okay, and it comes from Hamiltonian physics. So um, you might definitely be wondering, well, what does physics has to do with any? All right, so someone said, please no code, I'm art student. But hey, now art student is now science also, right? They got the new mix and match school. So there we go. Uh, yes, so Changxian mentioned, if you're confused about the code, density variable, uh, density is a, Oh yeah, the density variable is a function. My, uh, so sorry if, I, if that was unclear. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'm passing in the density that I'm interested in. So density is your posterior in this case. Okay. I think we have some time. Okay. Oops. No, no, no. Okay. So now we move on to Hamiltonian. Oops, C-A-Z. Uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Okay. So just now we saw the random walk metropolis, random walk metropolis, where you know we have a point, we sample something from this circle, we might accept, we might reject, and then you know we go like this. It's very slow. It tends to just circle back around, you know, it, it just doesn't know what it's doing. Why? Because each time you are sampling something that is completely random, so it has equal amount of probability to go backwards and to go forwards. So you don't really expect it to go in one direction very, very fast. Right? All you have is your accept reject to help you out. So we need ways to generate this even more efficiently. And this is where we use physics, uh, ideas from physics, which are fundamentally ideas from differential geometry. So again, this, uh, you, can, you can kind of see that they are unified in some sense with the same mathematical framework. So for this, I'm going to describe a bit of what the physics is or what it is trying to do. Uh, and note that this physics uh, that I'm about to describe, in this case, it is purely an analogy and that they play by the same rules of differential geometry. That's why it works. There's no real physics going on. Okay, Nothing's actually moving. Okay. So in Hamiltonian physics, uh, essentially we are interested in moving objects, how things move about, right? So in secondary school, you might be familiar with Newtonian physics, where you drop something and then it falls with some acceleration, uh, and, and this and that, and then you have your some equations. And Hamiltonian physics is kind of a generalization uh, of that idea. So we start like this. I'm very apologetic to start with symbols and equations, but I figured it's actually the simplest way to start. So here, Q is position, uh, P is momentum, and K is kinetic energy, U is potential energy, and H here is what we call the Hamiltonian 
or the total energy. All right. Um, so again, this is just some theory. You you can you do not have to understand much of this for to do what is about to come next. Uh, in fact, I'm not requiring you to code this up yourself because it's a bit of a hassle, and it just becomes of a coding practice more than yeah. The, the, you don't need that now. Okay. Um, so here the assumption is that we are able to convert our problem of sampling from a distribution somehow into a problem of physics. How does that work? How it works is like this. So you can imagine like a mountainous region, right? Um, when you sample around, right? When you sample around, you can in fact think about this sampler as a particle moving, right? And if you have some physics to help you out, you can move in certain ways, right? You can, you can move in some trajectory, for example, like this, right? If you have such a rule that helps you move according to the surface of the density, or rather like the kind of the curvature of the density, um, then you might be onto something because then you can use the shape of the, the, the kind of the, the slope to help you to go to regions of higher density or um, use that, that curve to help you man maneuver away from places where there's no density, right? So that's kind of the idea here. Um, this method uh, is due to, uh, Redford Neal in uh, fairly recently in the 90s or late 80s. Redford Neal, who's a kind of a famous statistician who's still alive. And he developed this, he called it the hybrid Monte Carlo uh, because it's kind of a hybrid between different ideas. Um, but now people call it the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, so HMC for short. So here, I am assuming a few things, right? I'm assuming that this Q corresponds to my sampler position, right? So the, the position of my sampler corresponds to the position of the particle, okay? And we can calculate some potential energy. We'll explain what it means. And then we will follow this equation where we will move the particle according to the rules of Hamiltonian mechanics. And what Hamiltonian mechanics says is that energy must be conserved so your particle must move in a way such that it trades off potential energy and kinetic energy, but the total must be the same. So that's kind of the, the basis of how this method is able to be used as a, a MCMC sampler. So as you move around your space and you stop, you are generating a new sample. That's the, that's the idea there, right? And why it's better is because with the ideas of differential geometry, you are able to use the slope of your density Right, to help you make better, uh, better proposals. Okay, so, uh, yeah. so the assumption here is uh, for those who are familiar with Hamiltonian physics, here I'm assuming a separable system, it, which means that I can separate kinetic from potential cleanly, where this has P and no Q, and this has Q and no P. Um, for the most part, I think for most implementation, this is the most popular one. Of course, in research, there are people working on all these variants that uh, tries to make things more generalized. Um, but this is by far a very popular method when it comes to MCMC. Uh, commercially, I think this is what people use the most. Yeah. Okay. So if you can't understand so far, it's, it's fine. Uh, yeah, but this is just some background. And P, P here, the momentum here, momentum it doesn't correspond to anything. So position correspond to the sampler, right? Meaning to say, if you stop at position three, your sampler value is three, right? But momentum is just what we call an auxiliary variable. It is just there to make the whole method work mathematically. It doesn't correspond to anything that you would use in your, um, in your posterior inference, in your estimation. Okay. So now let's write down a few things. We say that the potential energy, that the kinetic energy is defined as such. So this is a quadratic form. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. You can just treat them as vectors and matrices. So this is your mass matrix, which corresponds to your um, proposal distribution. So this is kind of like your proposal. And uh, this one typically we treat it as a one 
just so things are easy to write down and um, there's some nice things you can do when it's easy. Uh, for, ex for a practice, we just treat it as uh, the identity matrix. So we can just think of it as P, P over 2. And your new Q is equal to your negative log pi. Yes, so this is where it comes in. So your density, right, your target posterior, you take the negative log of that, that is your potential energy, okay? Right, and if you notice, uh, if we kind of write down again the, uh, we can you have some terms here, and again, um, remember that I said that I am only working with proportionality constants for my posterior. So when you have two pi sigma square, this doesn't matter because this is just a constant and proportional still holds, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and the fact that you don't need proportional, you don't need the evidence term or you can only work with proportionality is because in your accept, if your acceptance state, you remember you have this thing. Uh, in, your, in your acceptance reject state, you have this. This cancels out the evidence term, any constants on both sides, right? So if you have constant A, if constant A, you can cancel them out. That's why uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm quite sorry that I mentioned this only now. Uh, I slipped my mind. Okay. Okay, where, where was I? Um, okay. So once again, just to correlate things. So Q is your, your, your previous theta, right? Your sampler position. And then your U, your potential energy, it is, yeah, oh, I can write it like this. Your density, your density, yeah. And then your density is something that you must be able to compute, right? And uh, that's the correlation that you have between the methods. So one last thing is to figure out how the thing actually move, right? So you have the equation that tells you that you must move in a way that conserves all your energy, um, but actually how does it move? And it follows a differential equation so for those who are not familiar, uh, you can just listen to this as some general general knowledge, uh, but you don't have to really know this to, to get the method to work. Okay, but I'll write the differential equation down nevertheless. Okay. Okay. P, ET. So this is, so for students of physics, this should be a bit familiar. This is just a standard Hamiltonian equations. And this tells you, oh my God, my handwriting. And this tells you how the position change over time and how the momentum change over time. All right. And DH, DP, if you realize, it's just DK, DP. Because previously we, okay, we did mention that H, PQ, equals to kp plus uq, right? And kp we previously defined to be p transpose p over two. So uh, differential dkdp is just going to be uh, p, okay? And dh dq, uh, there's no very easy way to do it. Uh, you still have to take a differential. So this is important. So what we need is fundamentally, we need this and we need this. And we notice that, look at what's happening here. We need to be able to take the derivative of the negative log posterior. So right, I'll repeat it one more time. To get the method to work, we need to be able to take the negative log of the posterior, the derivative of that, okay? So, and this is where it makes sense that the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo works better because you are using gradient information. You're using gradient information to help you make a better choice in your proposal. Whereas random walk Monte Carlo is random. It is every time it's just independent. Um, but here you are using where you are, the location where you're at on the density, figuring out some type of density, uh, some slope, and then moving towards that slope. That's kind of the idea. So once again, I know this is a bit convoluted, but 
uh, try your best to follow. So you are trying to map your problem using the lens of physics to generate better proposals, right? So this is all in the name of generating good proposals because random walk generation is, is too inefficient, right? Nevertheless, after generation, you still have the same old accept reject step, okay? Um, so now you want to think about how to generate this using this uh, physics. So what we do is indeed we need to solve this equation. We need to solve this system. Solve this system. Solve this two equation. And um, we can only, we typically do so numerically, right? This is the very standard way of doing it. So to solve it numerically, we use what is called a leapfrog integrator. So don't worry, none of this you have to implement, right? This is just showing you what happens behind the scenes. Leapfrog integrator. Okay, what this means is this. So for, and I'll show you some visualizations later. For, uh, maybe for T. And these are, let's say, just whole numbers. So let's say these, this corresponds to time. And what we have is this system. Evaluated at Q, N. Oops. This is N. So this is an update. So you update the momentum using this equation. And you can see that this is a, what we call a half step because it's N plus half. Uh, and this is a full step. And then lastly, you have the full step. Another half step which gives you a total of full step. And, and this is evaluated here. Okay, so let me just draw a few things. So this thing appears here and here. This thing appears here. Uh, and this thing appears here, here. Um, yeah, so you can see in this computation, you need to pass things around quite a bit, right? And you need to be able to compute the gradient at two points, the gradient of negative log posterior, right? So you can see if you keep on looping this, this, uh, this set of uh, assignments, what you get is you update, you update P and then Q and then P and then Q and then P and then Q and then P and then Q. And then Q. So this if essentially solves the system in time. Right, so this is a numerical solver called the leapfrog integrator. Um, you, uh, it's the most common integrator. It has very important properties that makes it work, that makes the whole Monte Carlo work, and this is getting a bit technical, um, but this is one of what we call a symplectic integrator. Uh, so if you are wondering why you use this solver, because there are many types of solver, uh, this is one of the reasons. You can use other symplectic integrators, of course. Um, so one question is coming in. Why is it n plus half? Uh, this has to do with the it being a symplectic integrator. So um, I can only answer you uh, as best as I can if you know a bit of numerical solver. So if you are familiar with the Euler method, uh, then you are just doing full steps. So Pn plus 1, Qn plus 1, Pn plus 2, Qn plus 2. Um, but there's, there are problems with the Euler integrator such that uh, in, in many cases, it's not symplectic and your method doesn't work. Uh, and it's not that it performs poorly, it's that mathematically you can show that it doesn't work. Um, but with leapfrog integrators or symplectic integrators in general, it will work. So like the improved Euler, the improved Euler is better than the Euler, yes, um, but it is still not the leapfrog integrator. And um, in fact, I refer you to Neil's paper. He describes that very, very well. Uh, so new paper uh, in, I think it's 1993, but he has a 2012 uh, update of that paper. It's called MCMC using Hamiltonian dynamics, I think, using Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, and maybe later we have time, we can glance at the paper for a little bit, but that answers your questions, hopefully. Um, okay, so it is a lot of, Details and jargon, I'm so sorry, but I kind of feel I need to go through that so that you at least know what's going on under the hood. So essentially, this is what it is. You start with a uh, 
you start with a position and a momentum, right? And then you pass it through your leapfrog integrator, right? And then you integrate blah, blah, blah across some time. And that time is something you have to choose, right? So over uh, some step, we call it L. So call it L, over L steps. And you need to choose what L is. And this, this gives you P and QL at the end of the day, right? And you will use this to compute your acceptance ratio, which is defined by uh, exponential of negative H QL minus PL plus H Q naught P naught. Again, if you don't understand this, it's fine. You don't have to implement any of this. This is just for your knowledge. Here, write it down nicely. So you can see this is looking different from just now. Just now we simply have pi uh, proposal over pi current, right? And this is in fact the same thing because remember that everything is kind of negative log. So now this is simply exponential negative. I'm getting back this form, okay? So hopefully this is clear with everyone. So maybe just a quick sidetrack. So exponentially negative H1, I call this H1 and I call the other one H2, is the same as uh, negative H1, H2 is the same as uh, uh, what's the same again? Ah, no, no, sorry. Uh, H2 and same H1, like this. And then uh, then you can see that because this is a negative log, so when you exponentiate and negative it, you get back your pi over pi, right? Because H is by definition negative log pi plus k, right? So this is a bit of definition and derivation. You don't need to know this, right? But the, the core idea is the same, which is that you start with some initial position, you put it through, some process to generate a proposal. In this case, it is a rather sophisticated Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian physical system. And then at the end of the day, you just compute your acceptance ratio, right? And then you accept reject just as usual, right? Okay, um, any questions so far? Uh, okay, so if not, let me just pull your attention to a few things. So note that uh, man, can I refer to what I have? Uh, oh, I can. Okay. Uh, oh, where's that slide where I wrote the... Mm, okay, never mind. So, in, so let's think about what the choices we need to make. We need to think about L. We need to think about E. So L is the number of leapfrog steps, the number of integrating steps. And, and I'll explain what it is. And it's your step size nevertheless. So in, let's say, some distribution that looks like this, for example, the integrator might look like this. If you pick, let's say, equals five, I might go one, two, three, four, five. Okay? And then, uh, and then this will be my new sample, right? And then if I have a epsilon that is very big, right, then I'll be one, two, three, four, five. So step size is still important, right? And this is the number of steps, okay? Right, and why the number of steps is important, you might, you might imagine that, oh, I, I should just pick a very big number of steps, right, that I can go really far. Um, but that's not exactly how it works because uh, recall that whenever the particle moves, it has to move uh, to conserve the same total energy. So if this is the contour of H, uh, if this is a contour of your H or, or, or your uh, energy, then what that means is to say you can only move on a contour because to conserve the energy. And what that means is also to say that if you move too much, you come back where you start, right? So there's no point in doing that because you end up where you start. So you want to pick an L that is good that you kind of reach halfway, maybe somewhere far away, but not to the point that you look back towards yourself, 
So L is something that you need to tune and epsilon is something you need to tune. So these tuning factors are important when you uh, configure your method. Um, luckily, later I will show you that there are advanced um, procedures that allows you to be tuning free that you don't have to tune this by yourself. Uh, we won't implement those because those are really, really complicated, but we'll be using those. Okay, so now let me quickly show you some, uh, some visualizations. Okay. Okay, yeah. So here you can see that this is, uh, this is taken from this GitHub and it's a very helpful visualization. You can see I can pick a bunch of Hamiltonians. So, so this is what we did just now. And here you can see on my right hand, you can pick your proposal size. So similar, so this is what we have just now, right? So in this case, we have an underlying banana distribution uh, and we can make it we can make it fast. So you can see this is how you're generating using random walk metropolis. Okay. And this is what it looks like when you use Hamiltonian, right? You're, you're flying around, right? And uh, here you can see on the right hand side, you can tune the number of leapfrog steps and the step size as well. So if I take it less, it would take less steps, right? So you can see this is much more efficient in terms of generating samples far away from each other. And this is the state of the art. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it state of the art. It would the most popular and successful variant so far. There are, of course, more advanced variants that are in the kind of research phase that people are working on. Um, but if you go to any uh, commercial software or implementation, HMC is probably the most um, popular one and the best one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you want to look at more, and you can see obviously there's a, a whole bunch of different types of MCMC. Okay. All right, now we will move on to, okay, let's see here. All right, now I will move on to the next example. Uh, here I will, uh, oh. okay. So this is the second example uh, in the folder called HMC on loop. Uh, and I would like you to try your best. Uh, I, I'm so sorry if the explanation is, isn't very clear. Even as I hear it myself, I understand that it's, it's a lot of seemingly arbitrary information. Um, but here we're trying to solve a, a problem. So the problem is this. Uh, the problem is this, let me illustrate it. So, I have my forward model, which is my data generation process, which is here. Okay. And I get an observation according to here, right? So there are some ground truths. In this case, it is zero and one, right? So I put in zero and one, I get in, and then I add some noise and I get some observation, right? And from this one observation, I want to go back to figure out what is my sigma uh, sorry, pi, uh, sorry, theta zero and theta one. Okay, so if I just read out the questions a bit. Um, so we have this observation model, right? Where F is a forward operator given here uh, of the unknown. Uh, sigma is the noise intensity, which is given. And this is just some noise uh, to corrupt our data a little bit. And we take noise to be 10 to the negative one. And we acquire one observation. So again, this is where it comes, it comes back with your Bayes' theorem, right? Right, so we need to be able to form this and we need to be able to form this, okay? And then we can get our posterior. So we know this. We can do some algebra and we can see that This, right? this is just some, some simple manipulation. And note that we say that n is drawn from 0, 1. This means to say that this variable, this whole thing here, follows the standard Gaussian. All right, does that make sense? So this whole thing 
follows the standard Gaussian. Okay, so this would be kind of our, our big um, random variable if we can call it x. So similarly, uh, so wait, did I actually write my answers at the bottom? Ah, okay, I, I wrote it here so we can just type it in really. Yeah, so the goal of the inference is to identify the theta values given observation y equals one. Placing a standard Gaussian prior over theta, the goal of the problem is to infer set of, yeah, okay, I think I just repeated myself here, okay. So the potential energy or the negative log posterior, right, so the negative log posterior reads in this way, okay. So just to quickly derive it, you have your, um, you have your, this is your, uh, well, okay, maybe just to be completely clear. Oh man, I should, I should really be clear about this maybe. Okay. So here is a bit of writing things down. And if you put negative log on both sides, we can see that this is equals to negative log pi, negative log, and plus some constant k. All right, so this is a, a bit of a bit of uh, manipulation. Hope everyone can follow. Because when you log things, multiplication becomes addition. Okay. So this corresponds to this, and this corresponds to this, and this corresponds to this. Okay. And if you notice, our Gaussian has a very nice negative log. This is our Gaussian, for example, where we negative log it. We lock it, then exponential go away. Then we negative it, then this one go away. So all we are left with is just this very nice term, which is what we have over here at the bottom here. So this is our potential energy. Okay. All right, uh, I understand this can be a bit dense. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask us. I have no feedback, so I, I don't really know if I'm doing this justice okay but the point is we want to generate our target density previously i just give it to you right it's a gaussian density just write that down but now given a problem uh, a, a pseudo problem albeit uh, uh, we have the need to formulate a bayesian posterior okay right so if you will uh let's see here so uh I would like you to take maybe five minutes or maybe, uh, okay, yeah, we'll come back at 325 maybe. I want you to try up to uh, this, this part. Uh, whatever that happens below, um, I will walk you through it because that has to do with using the package um, that is written by one of the postdocs uh, uh, in my lab or who was in my lab, he's now uh, in the UK, but yeah. So I want you to try to write up to this point. And note that you do need to take the gradient. Uh, so you can compute the gradient of the potential energy with respect to theta. So we need to do a bit of handwriting. Uh, in real life, you can of course use uh, automatic differentiation or some differentiation software. But here I think it's nevertheless a good practice to just write down the gradient. Okay, uh, so fill in these two and fill in the forward function here. And I will see you uh, in five minutes. All right, let me go to the toilet real quick.
Okay, I'm back. Uh, any questions? Could you explain the likelihood function for y given theta? Yes, of course. Um, so that part, I agree, it's a little hard to, hard to see. Um, but here, uh, this is what it is. So the likelihood. So once again, this depends on the model. And this is a very common model. This is called an additive Gaussian noise model. This means to say that you have some uh, theta, some parameter to generate some measurements, and then we corrupt it with some noise by adding onto it. So this noise follows a Gaussian distribution, a standard Gaussian distribution, and sigma is just the noise intensity. So in essence, this whole thing, you can think about it as plus, uh, let's call it kappa, and then kappa comes from uh, zero. Uh, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as before. But for now, we use this formulation because I, I just like it a little better, right? So you can move things around. Uh, and this is technically, I think, eta. So y minus f theta divided by sigma. And notice that this is n, uh, this is theta. So this follows n01, right? Okay. And this means to say that, let's say I have a value. Um, this would mean, okay, let, let me just maybe draw a side-by-side -side comparison so that it may, maybe make it obvious. Let's say if you have x equals 5, right? How do you, how do you pick, uh, and, and let's say it follows a not standard Gaussian, what is the distribution? This would simply be 2 pi dxp x over 2 squared, right? Because sigma equals 1 here and mu equals 0. So this reduces to this form. Uh, agree? Each whole, can, can, does this make sense on the right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So similarly here, uh, one also. Oh, so sorry. No, this is, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is, yeah, I actually don't need this part anyway. Because again, it is just a constant. So let me just, let me just write like this. Uh, does this make sense? This whole thing is this. Wait, so sigma and mu is given as one and zero, is it? Uh, of this distribution, yes. But this is not the this sigma. Just to be clear, it's a bit confusing. But notice this whole thing follows the standard Gaussian. Yeah, I uh, yeah. I understand that part. Yeah. So I if I make y uh, as like the left hand side variable given the theta. So the or uh, because that is what uh, fundamentally what the the uh, likelihood is right it tells you how likely your data is to happen. Yeah. Given some sigma yeah. Yeah. So if I give you sigma, it means to say that you have this this form where your eta follows the standard Gaussian, and then that would be your likelihood function, right? Uh, okay. I think I need to like <laughs> look at it a bit. Uh, it, yeah. Okay. I understand this is a bit subtle because there are a lot of slightly subtle things. For example, like likelihood function is not a density. Um, it's it's a bit it's a bit of a technical detail, um, but essentially, you want to be able to relate your observations to a probability, and you can do that by leveraging on the fact that you know that eta comes from a standard Gaussian. Yeah. So just to be completely explicit, what we have is this. Uh,
yeah, like this. And then when you negative log it, both sides, what we are left with is just half. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Square. So that's our negative log likelihood. Okay. So all right. So let me try to get back here. Isn't the isn't the oh. p y given theta like is is basically the eta? Yeah, basically using eta, right? Yeah, substituting mm. the um. Alright, uh, never mind. I'll look at it like a bit more. <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, yeah, but I think you are roughly saying the same thing, right? Which is that you essentially you are just replacing y with uh, eta essentially, yeah, with a with a shifted again. It is eta shifted with some f theta divided by uh, sigma. So uh, that's oh. exactly what it is. Yeah, that's ex that's ex that's exactly what it is. Okay. Uh, what's going on? Um, Okay, so let me get back to the task at hand. Okay, so the forward model is quite straightforwardly uh, theta. Yeah, I, I'm just typing in whatever's shown to me here, right? Yeah. Plus three times theta zero uh, times. Uh, huh? Minus one. Looks good, looks good, looks good. Okay. So let me just run everything. Uh, okay. All right. So here, um, here again, we know that this is a toy problem. So we know that in fact, this is our final shape of our posterior uh, if it has zero noise. So this is our shape of our posterior. It is no longer a Gaussian, right? We are done with that toy stuff. Uh, this is still pretty toy, but uh, at least it's no longer something that is super, super trivial, right? Now we have a bit of shape to work with. So that means a good NCMC algorithm should be able to explore the entire shape, right? Whereas if you apply like a maximum likelihood or maximum uh, MAP estimate, you might just get one point. Probably, I mean, you will get one point and you wouldn't be able to detect that there's a whole set of solution. Okay. So potential energy is simply, wasn't it given? Uh, yeah, so it's given to you here, yes. So again, this is the prior. So this is a negative log prior, right? Again, our prior is a standard Gaussian. So if you take a negative log of a standard Gaussian, you get this. Okay, so I can just do something like sum theta. So this is just the same as taking the inner product. Uh, plus 0 0.5 times uh, y minus forward function, I think I call it forward function, theta uh, divided by sigma squared. Is it called sigma? Sigma, okay, sigma squared, yeah. And I my gradient is given, uh, my gradient would be theta uh, plus if oh there's a square here I'm missing. And if I if I take the gradient of this, just some quick algebra. Uh well actually no, you know what? I'm not gonna do it because it takes some writing down and I realize I yeah can't be bothered. Um well I don't have to do this actually. I can take this out. Uh but yeah, maybe you can write it out if you want. Uh so it will look something like this, right? So this thing. Take the gradient. Oops. All right, you get theta plus uh, f minus y two sigma uh, duh, 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 minus df d theta, and df d theta is given somewhere from the top, uh, which gives you uh, something like three no six theta, not. Uh, 
6 theta naught theta 1 square uh, minus 6 theta naught. Uh, yep, and then we have 2 theta 1, and this would be a trouble to write down 3 theta naught squared. Yeah, you can write this down, but uh, this software, or rather this package, uh, is able to take the differentiation for you. So for we just use that directly um, because sometimes writing things down, you might make mistakes. And in, in practice, you for very big matrices, it's, it's completely impractical to write things down. And most of the time you can't even, you can't even do that because you don't have a nice form to work with. So my apologies if I made you on that goose chase. I don't think you need this. I can take this out. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we introduce this package called Michi. So Michi is a uh, HM, it's a MCMC sampling package. Uh, it's written by Matt Graham, uh, who is now a postdoc at the Allen Turing Institute. He wrote this, um, and it works really, really well, and it's very easy to use. So every time you use it, it's kind of the same procedure. So first thing, you create a systems object, and you need to input the potential energy, right? Uh, as a function, right? And the, the input argument is called negative log density, neg log density, right? And there are a many bunch of systems that you can create, but here I'm using a Euclidean metric system. Uh, it just means that you can see, uh, you can see that it's a Hamiltonian system with a Euclidean metric on a position space, blah, 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 blah. Um, but essentially that just means that we are using a, potent, uh, a, prob a proposal function that is a simple Gaussian. So we can do that. Next thing we need to, uh, Next thing, what we need to do is to determine the integrator. So again, we have our density. The density is our potential energy. Uh, sorry, the negative log density is our potential energy. And next, we need to be able to solve this physical system and generate samples. So this is called the, the leapfrog integrator. And within the leapfrog integrator, we need to pick our step size, right? So in this case, I pick my step size to be about five times smaller um, than my noise. Right, uh, you can pick this yourself. And again, you can see that the bigger the step size, sometimes too big, you get bad performance. Right, so you create the system, you create the integrator. Next, you create the sampler. So the sampler here, I'm using this thing called the dynamic multinomial sampler. What this means is that I am, I am not choosing the uh, number of leapfrog steps myself. I'm using this thing called the no U-turn sampler, which means to say, once again, it is able to, you know, it is able to, let's say, go from here, here, and roughly stop before it stops looping back. That's why it's called the no U-turn, right? So this is, the implementation is quite advanced, uh, quite in, involved. The paper that describes this is about, I don't know, 30, 40 pages long, just about this choosing of deep drop step alone. So um, I don't think any person tries to Im implement this themselves in their own work. Uh, yeah, so you typically use um, some package implementation. Eh. Oh, this is okay. This is wrong. Oh, here. Sorry. I think this is a bit confused. Okay. And here, really, I just want you guys to run the code. Oh, where's this? Uh, huh? Uh, or oh, did I not run my stuff properly? Sorry. Uh, oh, my bad. I forgot to write my. Forgot to import autograd because I didn't write my um gradient, so I need autograd to do it for me. Uh, import autograd dot numpy. So for those who don't know what autograd is, um, it is it is a way to take. It is a package that does these nice things for you. And I can I guess I need copy process. Uh, no, I don't need to do this. Okay, so I install a few things. Uh, satisfied package, okay. Hopefully this works now. Okay, so you can see, and, and now last but not least, you can use the sampler to sample chains. 
uh, maybe I should go line by line. So, okay, so you define, once again, you define the system, then you go on to the integrator, then you go on to the sampler, that's it. That's it. For every system, you have a system which you define your density, put it inside. Your integrator, step size, put it inside. And sampler is your uh, leapfrog step. So if you don't want to pick it, you choose the no U-turn sampler where it picks it for you. And then you can start sampling. So here I'm sampling four chains at a go. Okay, and you can see this is taking a uh, relatively fast. You can get, uh, yeah, you can see, and this is the acceptance rate. Um, there's a bit of a details here and there. Um, if you have time, you can take a look at it. Um, and I'm recording the time as well, the start and the end time, but I don't think we really need that. And this data list is just the initialization points. So I'm initializing my, my uh, chains at four different points, right? One, one, negative, one, negative, one, one, negative, one, and negative, one, one. Okay. So there's a reason to run multiple chains at once and I'll briefly explain it later. Um, I don't think we have time for the last practice, so I'll just go through the solution with you. Um, okay. Uh, so it took about a minute and a half. So you can see, oh, what is this? So this is the, oops, let me get rid of this. So this is the trace plot so you can see and it's overlaying it. So you can see something is a little off because it is supposed to follow the contours of this, but it's not exactly doing that. So we might want to go back and check uh, to see if we did something silly here. Uh, huh. uh, the potential energy looks fine. My forward function, is it doing something silly? Uh, three times uh, no it's good yeah okay wait then let me see if okay where is it ah. okay hold on uh Sum of theta divided by two. Oh man, I should really stop making these little typos. Okay, give me a moment. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I am. Huh, I guess these are just not super fantastic samples in this case, but that's a little strange. Uh, wait, I think I did something wrong here. Um, um nope. I only insert two things, right? So it can't be. Oh my god, this is this is wrong. Ah, my math is wrong. Oh my god, they type my math wrongly. Goodness. Oh, that's a different model altogether. No wonder. Oh yeah, it becomes linear in one direction. Silly me. Okay, so sorry. I typed something completely wrong. Uh, yeah, if you notice, then that would make the shape completely different because it's no longer a loop. Yeah. Okay, to save time, let me, you know, actually, yeah, we can afford a bit more time here. And the last example, um, which is the HMC applied to an actual data set, uh, I will just walk it through with you. So let's give this to run. Uh, in the meantime, any questions? So this is trying to sample from a posterior 
that looks like a loop. Uh, is it every time when you like put the sample into the integrator, right? Then you get another sample. Then you use this new sample again and put it inside the integrator. Like yes. A, yes. In yes. Precisely. Yeah. So you are you are absolutely doing that. Um. Of course, in the actual software implementation, or if you ever want to implement it yourself, you probably want to do it in a more you know some type of vectorized or or parallel manner that you can make things a little faster. Um. But that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Why, why is there for, why, why do you use four chains? Ah, okay, yeah, well, actually while, while I was running on my end, so I explained that. So someone just now asked that, how do you know your chain is doing the right thing when you don't know the answer? Well, one simple way is to run multiple chains, right? So if you have, let's say, one chain start from here, go to here, one chain start from here, uh, go to here, and then one chain start from, I don't know, here, go to here, uh, Oops. Here, then you can roughly know that this region is roughly you have more confidence, right? Because it is saying that multiple chains starting from multiple positions are converging to the same point. Yep. Oh, okay. yeah. Confidence in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, is it done? Okay. Yeah, okay, this is much better. So so sorry, my I have a typo in my LaTeX. This should be zero. Apologies. Uh, yeah, this makes much more sense because this then give you like the circular shape. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so this gives you the sample. Yeah, so again, notice that at the end of the day, you do not have your blue circle. You just have all of these. And then now you are able to infer that there is some type of structure in your posterior, right? And last but not least, uh, okay, well, not last, but this is an important step as well. This is what we call the ESS and R hat here. You can see two things here. Here. The R hat is a number that more or less measures convergence. So the, the closer the number is to one, it means your chains converge. And you need multiple chains for this to work. Again, it works on the principle that if you have one chain that goes like this, and you have one other chain that goes like this, this is a good sign of convergence, right? This tells you that when the chains have converged, if you look into one portion, it is hard to tell one chain from the other. They both look the same. And that is a sign of convergence compared to a situation where you have one chain that goes like this and the other chain that goes like this. This one, you can see it's not converging, right? And the fact that the two are converging on different areas or on different places means that the, the, the total result is not converging. So this is very important because when you get a bunch of MCMC results, if you don't know what to do with it or you don't know how to tell if it's right or wrong, um, then the method is severely limited because yeah, you, you have no way of um, diagnosing it. Yeah. So R hat, you want to measure it between multiple chains. And uh, the rough intuition is that it measures the variance between the chains and within the chains. Right? When the chains have converged, the variance between the chains are very small. Oops. The variance between the chains are very small because they are very similar, right? Uh, so if you call like the, uh, I think it's something like this, something like this, R is something like this. It's not, it's definitely not this, but it's something like this. This is the within chain variance and this is the between chain variance. So between chain variance will go to zero when it has converged and this thing will almost approach one. That's kind of the idea, okay? Uh, and ESS is, a way to measure how efficient your chain is. So for example, I can say that this chain, let's say if I draw an example chain, this chain is less efficient than this chain, right? You can see this chain is, is going more, is mixing much more, is exploring more, whereas this chain is exploring very little, right? So the way we measure this is we use um, ESS, which has measures to do with um, correlation between the samples to measure how many roughly equivalent of uh, independent samples do we have in all these chains. So if I have a thousand samples here, and if I have a perfect independent sampler, roughly how many independent samples would that correspond to? So maybe only a few. So in this case, you can see that these are the numbers. So even though I sample my chains for like what, 2000 samples, Essentially, this is 30, about 30 independent samples, and this is about 60 independent samples. So you can see one of the drawbacks of HMC is that you need to run it for a long, long time in order for it to be able to get a good result. 
and you can see R hat, the values here, uh, is 1.02 and 1.01. 1.01, actually I think some sources say 1.01 is the general cutoff. So you want your chains to go lower than 1.01, then you can say that it's converged. So in this case, this, this is not exactly super converged yet, um, but it's, it, it, given that we have some visual confirmation, we can say that it, it still makes a lot of sense the results, okay? And by the way, to use this is we use the Arvis uh, library. It's quite straightforward, just Arvis. And the trace is just the output of the, uh, output of the sampler. So when you sampler, it outputs the trace, it outputs some statistics for you to, to look at, and output some of the state information. So trace is the trace plot, and we need to put the trace plot into Arvis, and then get ESS. And then we put trace plot into Arvis.rhead to get rhead, that's it. And um, the rest is just some, you know, some formatting things. So this is essentially uh, sampling with HMC on, uh, on a loop type of posterior structure. Yeah. Any questions? We have about, uh, about 10 minutes left. So I think it's about time we wrap up. Uh, I thought if there's four change, there should be four numbers. Uh, four, oh, okay, yeah, good question. So if there's four chains, there should be four numbers. So the R hat, there should be one number because R hat is computed across chains, right? So R hat is, would be something like, yeah, one chain, two chains, three chains, four chains. And then if everything is converged, which I need multiple chains to be able to determine, and then I say, okay, it's less than 1.01. So that's, this is a one number thing. But you're right that multiple chains should have multiple ESS, right? So each chain, you should be able to distill it down to its equivalence of independent samples. But in this case, uh, we are combining all the chains together because after all, we are sampling from the same distribution. There's no reason to use them separately. We should just pull them together. Hmm. That's why we have one number, yeah. Uh, and in this case, the two numbers correspond to the two dimensions, by the way. So sigma naught and sigma one. So you, you could imagine a case where you explore a lot in one direction, uh, in one of the components and very little in the other. So that happens sometimes, you know, if, you're, if your distribution is like this. It's very easy to move up and down, but it's very hard to move sideways because it is very constrained. So in this case, you end up just moving up, uh, sliding up and down one direction and not exploring the other. That's sometimes that happens, yeah. So the two numbers correspond to two parameters, not the number of chains. Okay, uh, I'm so sorry that we have really ran out of time, um, but if, uh, if I can maybe just show you one last thing. Uh, okay, then hey, let me show you the results. Okay, where is it? Uh, so I'm gonna show you one last example uh, just to show how it works in, in, a, in an actual problem that is not a toy problem. Uh, here, we have uh, exercise. Okay, so this is the problem. Okay. Um, so the, the final task, uh, again, this is just to show you guys, and hopefully if, you, uh, if this lesson has inspired you to learn more about the method or whenever you see something in the future where you have data and you want to infer some parameter and you go, yeah, this, how, how do I do it? Or maybe your uh, optimization method works not, doesn't work well, or the fact that you believe that there's some information to be learned about uncertainty, you can use this method and you can definitely use this, soft, uh, use this package to help you do your analysis. So the final task is just to predict the calories burned um, through the duration of an exercise. So it's a fairly straightforward type of problem. You can imagine the relation should be quite you know, direct, right? The longer you exercise, the, the more calories you burn, uh, hopefully, right? Um, so I use some data, uh, some CSV data, uh, and I extract the relevant stuff and I can plot it. So this is just a plot to show that, maybe I can make it, this. Okay, this is just to show that. Um, oh wait, I'm not showing this, am I? Wait. Oh boy, so sorry. I'm not showing this part. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so this, so sorry, yeah. So the last example is just predicting calories burned through the duration of an exercise. And um, this is just a data point. So clearly you can see that it's kind of a straight relationship and I'm using a linear regression to fit it. That's all I'm doing. And I want to be able to do um, MCMC, HMC specifically on the, uh, on the covariates of my linear regression. Yes. So again, this is how I started out. So my initial guess is pretty horrible. This is just a random guess. I want it to hopefully, in the end of the day, fit it. And then I want more than that, I want the uncertainty, okay? So I can just do the same spiel, uh, sample it. In this case, I only did one chain because uh, just for an example. Um, yeah, the, these numbers don't, don't really help that much because Uh, maybe this one, yeah. So you can see I, I run four chains in this one uh, and they are pretty horrible at the start and we can sample them. Uh, and I could sample them. Uh, of course, this was just from some previous run that I didn't complete, but the results are here nonetheless. And you can see this is my final output. And you can see that I can get a relatively nice representation. Um, I'm inferring not just the covariates of my linear regression, I'm also inferring the noise intensity Right, so previously we have uh, previously we have something like this, right? Now this is my linear regression, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm inferring both this, yeah. So I'm putting them together. So I'm inferring both at the same time. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. Okay. And uh, this is my result. You can see it's a nice. Uh, Again, okay, this is a simple problem, so it's not so hard to fit. But more importantly, I can get some estimate uh, of my uncertainty. Yeah, and you can see that this kind of covers nicely the range of result that it produces. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's it. Uh, the final parts have been, has been rushed. Uh, I hope this has still been overall helpful to you. And if you want more information about this, which I'm sure there are some parts that I'm not able to cover in time because it's not that relevant to the implementation. Um, um, but if you're interested to find out more or to really master the subject, uh, I refer you to the paper written by Neil himself, or you can, of course, let me know uh, if you want to know more information. And any final questions? Okay, uh, if not, then then I shall stop sharing. And uh, so yeah, just to quickly wrap up. So today we spoke about how we can generate uh, a problem from Bayesian statistics uh, that gives us a posterior and the posterior can describe most things you want to find out in a lot of data science problems. And we want to be able to estimate that posterior using Monte Carlo theory, which means that we can use samples and take an average. And then how do we get those samples? We want to generate Markov chains, right? Markov chains of samples. And to do so, we have to do it efficiently. So there are the basic way, random walk, which is not very efficient. And we have very efficient ways, such as the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And this field is still very kind of, uh, kind of evolving. There's a lot of new MCMC techniques coming up every, every few months. Uh, and it's quite an exciting thing. Um, and what people are trying to work on is to push down the time, make it more efficient, make it easier to tune and understand the behavior of all these sampling techniques. And uh, yeah, so hopefully this adds another dimension to what you use as a data scientist or uh, just a scientist in general uh, in your problem solving. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you. All right, hope you guys, hope you guys learned something. <laughs> <laughs>